good evening. There are strange tales that run through many different human societies and exert such a hold in our imagination that they pop up time and time again. Tonight we look at two of those legends. The phantom hitchhiker is a modern myth, the stranger who appears at the roadside, accepts a ride and then disappears. But first, a more ancient belief, the power of the curse, like the Earls of North Esk, who were haunted by a green lady whose appearance at Ethy Castle in Tayside means one of them will die. But our example tonight is a Celtic tale that happened not so very long ago. The remote and beautiful islands of the Outer Hebrides. Their isolation means they've been only lightly touched by the 20th century. The islands are much as they were when the Vikings first landed over a thousand years ago. And the old superstitions are still a part of everyday life. We're very religious. Whether we're Christian or not, we're very, very religious. Even those who perhaps have abandoned God are still got that superstitious side to their natures. This is all very much part of our makeup. And uh, graveyards particularly. In this ancient and overgrown burial place, within the grounds of the ruined Howmore Chapel, lie the remains of the clan of Clan Ranald, buried here since 1490. Ranald MacDonald is the 24th chief of Clan Ranald. He believes the clan has its own special protection. The sad thing is that anybody who actually tampers with the property of the clan have never really had any advantage and have often has not had, you know, met with some evilness and the property has always been returned. There are those who believe that many of the ancient medieval artifacts on the Hebrides have strange mystical powers. The modern word might be cursed, but I would like to use something more remote than that. It is something that holds the whole spirit together, because we've been going so many, many centuries. Whatever it is, the power of the curse has reappeared throughout the history of the clan. During the 1745 uprising, Redcoat soldiers broke into the clan's island graveyard, intent on stealing the valuable St. Finnan's bell. Come back, you but the bell was to be their downfall. Whatever they did, it refused to stop its eerie, persistent ring and attracted the attention of the local caretaker. St. Finnan's bell was returned to the Clan Ranald clan, its rightful home. St. Finnan's bell has been taken twice during the last couple of centuries. Both times, I'm told, the people who've taken it have met a, 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 an unhappy uh, end, but the bell has always returned to the altar. The clan believes that whenever its property has been threatened, the curse has returned. The Clan Ranald Stone bears the ancient symbols of the clan and marks the resting place of Alan Moydart, famous chief and protector of the clan who died 400 years ago. A reproduction of the gravestone was built into the walls of the clan's castle by French stonemasons in 1708. The castle took seven years to build, but was occupied for only seven years. On the night before the clan chief died in battle, the castle was consumed by fire. Still, the stone survived. But more recently, there was a further threat to its existence. Early uh, one morning, about four or five years ago, the man who uh, runs the uh, home farm heard this chipping, and he looked towards the castle ruins, and there was a man trying to prise out the uh, armorial stone with a hammer and a chisel. So he just chased him for his life. We don't know to this day who he was. It seemed that the legend of the clan was again protecting all its ancient monuments. But then disaster struck. The clan's most important relic, the Moidart gravestone, was stolen. It was 
one morning when my niece wanted to go and look at the stone, and uh, we went into the graveyard, and she said, it's not here. I said, of course it's there, just move along round the corner, but it wasn't there. Later, one of the crafters showed me a mark where the stone had obviously been dragged from the graveyard all the way along, several hundred yards, to the parking place outside the church. Then we alerted the police. As shock waves hit the community, people wondered how the 300 weight gravestone could have been stolen without detection. To get it out, well, they must have used a small crowbar or something, and, 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 and I mean, it's within the wit of man, but it, it would have been quite a difficult, determined journey to get that from chapel to boot of car. Amongst the islanders, the theft reawakened memories of the old clan legends. Well, the local people knew that to desecrate any graveyard is really bad, and because they were so shocked, they knew that no good end would come to the story. The search for the stone continued, but only one man knew where it was hidden, in a tiny London bedsit. The legends had said the grave robber would be doomed to an early death. Would the curse prove to be simply a quaint piece of history? The clan chief never stopped believing in its power. In terms of the clan, which was nearly a thousand years, it, it wasn't a long time that it had gone, and I wasn't that concerned that it had gone forever. I thought that it would turn up sooner or later, somehow or other. It was to be five years before the clan heard any news. The first signs of the missing gravestone surfaced here at the British Museum. I was working late one night in February in the museum, and I got a phone call from the information desk. They told me there was a gentleman there who urgently wanted to see someone. Uh, they said he was a little upset. And so I spoke to him over the phone and he came down to the department. We get all sorts of inquiries on the duty desk in the department, but this was one of the most curious uh, stories that I've been involved in. He showed me a photo of a carved stone, which he said was in a nearby flat in Euston. He said his son had been on holiday some years previously uh, on South Uist and had found it in a field and brought it back to London. He was in London for his son's funeral. His son had died quite suddenly a week or so previously. On the 22nd of February, 1995, almost five years to the day since the stone was stolen, 33-year-old Lauren Mabin died alone in a London flat. Only a few feet away from his bed was the stone of Clan Ranald. The coroner's verdict was death by misadventure. I was not surprised, but when it was found in these circumstances, I said, it's a sort of thing that might have happened in the Celtic world, not in the heart of London. When I first heard that the stone was found, of course, I was delighted. But as information gathered, I was little concerned and, 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 and saddened and, and, and slightly spooked by the fact of the boy's death. And it rather brought reminiscences of, you know, various things I'd heard and, and, and the history of our clan. Beneath the disquiet, there was some sympathy for the outsider who'd stolen the island's heritage. Remember, everybody who live in our cities are searching for roots. They would do anything to catch up with roots because a lot of people nowadays in the last hundred years have lost their roots and are wandering about the surface of the earth aimlessly, whereas we can describe the people we came from back to seven, eight, nine generations. So it was that on the night of June the 10th, 1995, the clan gathered at the quayside for the stone's return to its ancestral home on South Uist. Yeah, 
its final journey from London was almost complete. It was to arrive as it had left, in the boot of a car. The following day, the island turned out to celebrate. Among them, Neil Macmillan from the local historical society, who was there to give a Gaelic welcome. They're very proud that the stone has come back, and it's it's been uh, the story behind it is really out of the world how it found its way back. Uh, but uh, people are delighted that it is back, and it's here to stay now. And perhaps this time, the curse of the Clan Ranald clan will finally have been laid to rest. Some will dismiss the story as superstitious nonsense, but the clan leaders have managed to stay in power for nearly a thousand years, so maybe Clan Ranald do have something watching over them. If you haven't heard a phantom hitchhiker story, then someone you know probably has. It's become a modern myth, a story so appealing it's destined to be told and retold, despite the fact that concrete evidence is hard to come by. But if it was possible to track down those who'd experienced it at first hand, would their evidence stand up to closer examination? Well, tonight we talk to some individuals who say they gave a ride to a phantom hitchhiker. Maria Rue and Gil Pretorius had recently become engaged and on Good Friday in March 1968 were driving through the arid scrub of the Karoo Desert, 200 miles east of Cape Town. They were going to meet her parents to discuss their wedding plans. The route was taking them towards Uniondale along the N9. A lift. Are you right? Where are you going? You know, you ought to be careful. It's dangerous out here for a young girl like you. Where are you? Puzzled and frightened, Anton Lechronchi headed straight for the police station in the nearest town, Uniondale. Today, the station is run by warrant officer Moshtert. Sergeant Potrito was on duty. He was alone on duty. Sir, you got a problem? When uh, Mr. Lechronchi came in, he told Sergeant Potrito about experience he had on the road. I was driving into town and, and, I, and I stopped to pick up this girl hitchhiking. I don't know, man. She, she just disappeared. What exactly do you mean, just disappeared? Sergeant Potgieter didn't believe the man. And uh, he think the man wants to waste uh, his time. Ach, no, man, you've been drinking. I swear to you, I've never been more sober in my life. I'm sorry. Listen, please just come out there with me. Let's see Sensing what Sensing that the was not joking, Snowy Potgieter agreed to go back with him to the spot. I 
Now, Sergeant Portugal, you didn't rattle in situations. But in this specific situation, he rattled. Did you see that? Yeah, you fiddling with the door. I didn't touch it. It wasn't just that, that you, did you hear the woman laughing? Look, Mr. Lkhranzi, I'm getting tired and impatient. Now, we'll drive past there once more. This time, you put the interior light on, you put your hands on the steering wheel. I'll be right behind you, and I'll be watching. Hey, unlock your doors! Did you see that? Yum! Listen, let's just get the hell out of here, man! When uh, Sergeant Potkito came back, he was snow white in his face and he was rattled. So he le left the police station, he locked the station and went home. For Snowy, the description of the girl had stirred some unsettling memories. At about 8 o'clock Sunday morning, Snowy confronted me and said, do I remember this girl that was killed in the Sydney accident a few years ago? Pat McDonald had been the first officer to the scene of the crash that day. I found a Volkswagen Beetle off the road and a girl was lying on her back with her head against the one embankment. She had died of head injuries. I later ascertained that her name was Maria Rue. The driver survived. I explained to him what the girl actually looked like, um, which was exactly the same description that was in the Kern's book given by Le Kransi. The word spread around Uniondale like wildfire. There was a phantom hitchhiker on the N9. Within days, the newspapers had got hold of the story and contacted Maria Rue's mother. I told her about the story and that the people uh, thought it's her daughter that is uh, haunting in, in the Uniondale area. And, uh, and she gave me, she said, fine, I can get a photograph of her. Anton Lecronchi was asked if he could recognize the girl he'd given the lift to. Would he pick out Maria? That's her. That's her. Uniondale's phantom hitchhiker had been identified as Maria Rue. There were no more sightings of her until two years later. Corporal Dave van Jasveld was doing his national service at Utschorn Army Base, 100 miles from Uniondale. He was on his way there to spend holidays with his girlfriend. His journey took him along the N9. When I reached the intersection, I saw somebody standing in the road, on the side of the road. Just as I turned to the right, she kind of lifted her arms up, like, oh no, aren't you going to stop? Why do you want to lift me to town? music. I asked her to, to please hold tight around my waist so that I can feel if something goes wrong. After a few, say a kilometer or two, the bike had a twitch. I thought she fell off. A lot of things went through my mind. I turned around. I wanted to see if I still had somebody with me. There was nobody. I turned around. I, I went back with the motorcycle, looked if there was anybody lying along the road. And then I got a fright. I mean, I saw the helmet. It's back on. The earphone is just uh, lying there. And then I just had to move off because I realized then that I didn't actually pick somebody up. 
Davi was badly shaken. Not knowing what could have happened to the girl, he fled to the safety of Uniondale. A couple Davi from Jasveld also said she was a shortish girl, dark hair, she's a brunette, short hair, and she had slacks on and, uh, and a jersey. And that was the description of La Grancie as well. I'm telling you, it scared the living daylights out of me. I didn't think there was something wrong at that time. I didn't notice that it was a spirit or something. Uh, but I, I, I did feel strange. Any suspicions Darby might have had were reinforced when he returned to his bike. The headset was ruined. It was completely done. It was melted, you know, it was unusable at all. And the helmet, too, turned out to be unusable. The helmet that uh, the lady uh, put on, uh, this is the helmet, and uh, nobody wore this helmet after she had put the helmet on because even my girlfriend wouldn't wear it again. She was too scared. The third appearance of the Phantom Hitchhiker was in 1980. On Good Friday, Andre Hertzi was driving along the N9 past Uniondale, looking for a friend who he thought might have run out of petrol in the desert. All of a sudden I felt hands around my waist. I could actually well feel the pressure, and as I looked down, well, I saw the hands. I was very, very scared. And well, I felt that I must get away from that place. That's when I accelerated. And like I said, at about 150 or 160 watts, she gave me a few whacks against her head. And then she just disappeared. Never saw nobody standing next to her over nothing. Once again, it was Uniondale that was the first to hear of the latest sighting. I think I've seen the ghost. I was riding my bike down the Andre Kurtz's was a third confirmed and, sighting, and but since then there have been numerous unconfirmed I reports of the phantom hitchhiker. And they were real. There have been lots of theories as to why the ghost of Maria Rue should continue to haunt the N9 since that fateful Easter of 1968. Local journalist Yanni Meyer has been following the story for over 20 years. One of the theories why she apparently can't get, can't go to rest for good is that uh, she was fast asleep in the car when the accident happened and she didn't prepare herself for death. She dearly wanted to finalize her wedding arrangements and uh, the theory is that she will carry on until she reached the, her destination. The phantom hitchhiker story first came to prominence in Britain in the 1950s, particularly on the A38 between Wellington and Taunton in Somerset. But the earliest sighting was of a mysterious man in black forever striding along the road towards some Boswells in the border regions. The witness, a Miss Louisa Scott, didn't actually call him a phantom hitchhiker, but that might be because the date was 1893. Good night. <laughs>